Bring Back the Glory, Volume 1, a book written by Goodheart, Obi Ekweme, narrated by Omenesa Oruma Akomolafe. Chapter 1, Discerning the Church And it came to pass, when he made mention of the Ark of God, that he fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck brake, and he died. For he was an old man and heavy. And he had judged Israel forty years. And his daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was with child, near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken, and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed. For her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou had borne a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel. Because the ark of God was taken, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory is departed from Israel, for the ark of God is taken. 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 18 to 22. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give thee, saith the Lord of hosts. Haggai chapter 2, verse 9. The church is the last hope of this perishing world. The Father sent Jesus. Jesus sent the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost gave birth to the church. The church is the carrier of the presence and power of the Holy Ghost on the earth today. When the Holy Ghost is lifted and the church by extension is lifted from the earth, chaos will break out upon the face of the earth. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Second Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14. The healing of the land is connected to the position and relationship of the church with God. The church's response to the Father will determine how God, by extension, would respond and relate to the earth. The church is the answer to the plight and problems of mankind today. However, the church that will resolve the problems of the world is not the church that you and I know today. The church must undergo a requisite preparation before the outpouring of the glory of God that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26 to 27. Such is the church that Christ desires and intends for you and I to be a part of it. A church that the Bible declares that shall be a mountain that will command the attention of nations. Prophet Isaiah predicted. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow onto it. Isaiah chapter 2 verse 2. The end time church will not be a church that is known for disgrace and shame, but it will be a church that is known for glory and honor. This is the very intention and heartbeat of God. The two major ingredients required for this church to become glorious is unity and purity. Why unity? The church must come together because God is about to do something mind boggling to the intent that no one but God will take the glory to himself. It will not be the movement of a star or the movement of some lone vibrant ministry. It will be the movement of the body of Christ united. The other component, equally important, is purity. The church needs to go through a process of purification. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Obadiah chapter 17. Three key qualities of the church are identified in the above scripture. Number one, power will be displayed. Number two, purity will be made manifest. And number three, prosperity will be made available. 
The kind of wealth God has ordained for the church is not man-made. It has its source and its root in God. God's kind of blessing adds no sorrow whatsoever. For the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 22. Society, sadly, is a reflection of the state of the church today. The methods of the world system, it seems, has crept into the church. We find the same degree of corruption and the same lustful craving for position and status, visibility, popularity, and notoriety, the same greed for mammon and ill-gotten wealth. What we find in politics is now found in the church. This ought not to be. We must be sincere enough to look ourselves straight in the eyes and speak to ourselves some gospel truth that what we have right now is not the church that God intended. This is not the church he died for and definitely not the church he is coming back for. This is a great indictment on every person that professes Christianity. Too many Christians today live their lives in hypocrisy. Many are immediately transformed in their outlook, posture, and position when in church, a complete contrast to who they are outside the church premises. Their appearance on a Sunday is different from who you might encounter between Mondays and Saturdays. This is hypocrisy. A hypocrite is an actor. An actor is a man that takes up a role on stage, which is a contradiction of who he is of stage. Many believers are largely actors. They put on their costumes on Sunday mornings before they walk through the church gate. But by the time they come through the doors of their workplaces on Monday morning, something it seems has apparently gone wrong. Who they really are shows up on the job. These things ought not to be. If only we understood that church, or better still, Christianity, is not a religion but a lifestyle, we would put our act together. Some Christians get jobs as civil servants, politicians, career professionals, and forget the values of the kingdom of God. The way they conduct themselves is akin to that of the Pharisees of Jesus' day. Jesus Christ had zero tolerance for the Pharisees, not because they were sinners, but because they were double-faced. They were hypocrites, lukewarm, and neither here nor there. They offered prayers not because they were acknowledging a God who hears prayers, but for the man to see how pious they were. Jesus did not spare them. He said, but woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against man. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Matthew chapter 23 verse 13 to 14. If there are any qualities that God desires of believers today, it is the quality of truth and sincerity. God can handle a person who is sincere and truthful more than one who is pretentious that all is well when all is not well. Behold, thou desireth truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part. Thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Psalm 51 verse 6. God says, I desire truth in the inward parts, for I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. 3 John chapter 3, verse 4. Where are you really in the journey of life? Have you reached a plateau on your course? Are you fallen? when you think you are standing? Chapter two, examine yourself. God desires that in route perfection, Christian believers should at least be sincere and truthful. God will speedily help a person who is sincere before him. It is very important that from time to time, you pull back from yourself, your conducts, behaviors, and posture and sincerely examine by the help of the Holy Ghost, your spiritual walk before the Lord. Examine what is the spiritual climate of your soul. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. 
2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Where are you really in the journey of life? Have you plateaued on your course? Are you fallen when you think you are standing? Have you gone cold and assumed you are burning hot? Have you backslided even though you are still in church? Could it be that you are in church but not in touch? Have you begun to lose the cutting edge of your walk with God? How is the favor, tenacity, and fervency of your prayer life? Have you begun to lose the cutting edge of your walk with God? Have you begun to withdraw from the regular and consistent discipline of consuming the necessary food of God's word as you did in the past? It is time to probe yourself before the Lord. When you examine yourself, you must remember that your only standard and yardstick is Jesus Christ. You must not compare yourself with your neighbor. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. That glory in the above verse of Scripture is designed by God to be progressive. Self-examination is a responsibility incumbent upon every individual to prove his own self, but it requires you being sincere and truthful. The sad thing is that too few people are sincere and truthful. One of the greatest virtues one can get as a believer is to possess a heart that is tender before God. Psalm 51 verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Psalm 51 verse 17. Many hearts today are no longer tender before God. Conscience is gradually becoming seared and insensitive to what is right or wrong. We have come to the point where compromise has become normal and right. The enemy's allurements have grounded many in moral decadence. How can you come this far in God and miss the glory he has in store for you? The Bible says we have a cloud of witnesses watching us from heaven. They are watching in envy and jealousy to see the people that God has chosen and elected to carry and manifest his final glory upon the earth. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Haggai chapter 2 verse 9. Whatever you saw in David's tabernacle will be second place to the enormous glory coming on the church. Whatever you saw in Solomon's temple will not be comparable to the glory that shall fill the end time church. Everything you read in Acts of the Apostles will be exceeded by the manifestations of the days ahead. Nothing is comparable to this glory. Whatever is needful for you to do, you must do to come into this glory. There is nothing we have or desire that is worth mortgaging the glory. The Ministry of the Word Ideally, the Word of God is supposed to bring about conviction when it is preached or read. God never speaks to condemn or judge outrightly. He speaks to set standards and allow you to compare yourself with Christ in the Word. And by that, you are able to make adjustments in your life through repentance and prayers. Some people only hear or read the Word casually. Some even think the Word is not addressed to them. The Word of God is meant for you, the hearer. The Word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. Every time you hear the Word, there is a doctrine, reproof, correction, or instruction for you. Always look out for these when you listen or study God's Word. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Second Timothy chapter three, verse 16 to 17. Change and transformation does not come cheaply. They come on the back of a dare price. Change requires a willingness to go through the necessary pain and process in order to arrive at the place called there. People who are going through metamorphosis are those who have renounced living their lives to please people and have determined to live their lives to please God. 
That is to say, their interests are no longer how people view to perceive them, but their singular interest under heaven is to please God. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Galatians chapter 1 verse 10. The church does not belong to any man. It belongs to Jesus. It is therefore his prerogative to build his church. Chapter 3, Building the Church of Christ. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Matthew chapter 16 verse 18 to 19. The church does not belong to any man. It belongs to Jesus. It is therefore his prerogative to build his church. As clearly stated in the above scripture, it is not any and every church that prevails against the gates of hell. It is the church that Jesus has built that prevails against the gates of hell. Our responsibility as ministers of the gospel is to strive to build that church according to heaven's blueprint that it may be said as it is in heaven, so it is on earth. The church is not brick and mortal. It is human lives. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 10. As sons and daughters of God, we should be able to discern the night season coming upon human existence. That day should not take you unaware. There must be something in your heart that is telling you everything is changing. The church is changing, the economy is changing, and nations are changing. This is what will help anchor your life between heaven and earth. You are not meant to just live here and forget heaven or to live in heaven and forget earth. You are meant to anchor the earth. He says, Occupy till I come. Luke chapter 19 verse 13. In other words, be faithful and attentive in bringing kingdom principles to bear around you. Being a blessing to your world, your generation, but let your eyes be set on eternity. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Mark chapter 8 verse 36. Levels of glory. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 41. No glory surpasses the glory of the Almighty God. However, glory is in levels and dimensions. There is the glory of the sun, there is the glory of the moon, there is the glory of the stars. When we speak about the glory God is going to reveal to his saints, it is expedient that we define that the glory shall be upon us as individuals and that it will be in measures and dimensions. What recommends the dimension of glory you bear is not really the choice of God. It is what extent you apply yourself to go through the course. Everybody is equally called and appointed unto glory, and God has called you on a particular course. If you stay the course, it will lead to the release of your glory. When you get this message, you will become content with who God made you to be. You would never want to be anybody else. The issue is too many people are not ready to take the heat that is found on their pathway. If you cannot take the heat, you cannot be glorified. Do not lift yourself up before God lifts you. Do not raise yourself before God raises you. Glory is in weights. The heavier the glory, the more resplendent its carrier. Glory can be easily appreciated when likened to the weight of gold or silver. Beware of Satan's counterfeit. As there is a glory of God, the devil also seeks to offer us some of his own brand of glory. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, 
All these things will I give thee if thou will fall down and worship me. Matthew chapter 4, verse 8 to 9. Satan always seeks to abort God's plans by presenting shortcuts that result in counterfeits. Accepting Satan's offer is to be derailed from the path to God's greater glory. The path to God's prepared glory is always straight and narrow. So Satan will offer you an alternative access that is broad and undemanding. The path to the glory of God is marked with trials and self-emptying experiences. Then was Jesus led up off the spirits into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hunger. Matthew chapter 4 verse 1 to 2. On his path to empowerment, Jesus was not found in a Chinese restaurant or in a palatial villa. The spirit took him to the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out of a fame of him through all the region round about. Luke chapter 4, verse 13 to 14. If you are going to experience the real glory, you simply have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and refuse the devil's antics. Apostle Paul said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. A part of the requirement for you to see the glory of God is to finish your course. Some of your course requirements include going through a measure of suffering and temporal pain. For whom he did foreknown, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Romans chapter 8, verse 29 to 30. You are destined for glorification, but the process is through predestination, calling and justification. If gold were the first level of glory, for instance, and you desire to be a golden Christian, you must be ready to go through fire for refinement. You cannot become golden until you are willing and prepared to go through heat. These are sufferings you go through because you live right. There is such a thing as suffering for Christ, and there is also suffering for not being wise. Beloved, Think it not strange concerning the fairy trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 to 13. If you want to partake of his glory, you must be willing to identify with his sufferings. But he knoweth the, the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Job chapter 23, verse 10. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you? And fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Colossians chapter 1 verse 24. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Romans chapter 8 verse 16 to 17. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us as a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 to 18. And it came to pass, when he made mention of the ark of God, that he fell from off the seat and backward by the side of the gate and his neck break and he died for he was an old man and heavy and he had judged Israel 40 years. Chapter 4 Bring Back the Glory The church is not just a good idea. The church is God's great idea. 
The church is God's solution to the ills and tragedies that mankind faces today on the earth. The church, when it is working and functioning as God designed it, is a place of refuge, a citadel, a fortress, and a place of defense for God's people. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. The entire world is kept and estranged under the hold of wickedness. God devised the church to rescue and shield man from the wickedness of the world system. The Bible says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it, and it is safe. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 10. The church is the place where the Lord had chosen to put his name. When people run into the church, they ought to find refuge, divine protection, and rest. Jesus said, Come unto me, all he that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew chapter 11 verse 28. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Matthew chapter 18 verse 20. Where the people of God are gathered, not in the name of a man, but in the name of the Lord Jesus, we are guaranteed of his presence in their midst. Whenever God shows up in the midst of a people, he shows up not to take sides. He shows up to take over. The Bible declares that the church is the house of God. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thy artest to behave thyself in the house of God which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. A house is built for several reasons. Houses are to keep us from the elements of the earth, the sun, rain, wind, and dust. They are to secure us from danger, protect and preserve us and all ours. In like manner, the household of God is designed to keep us from the ills of the land and to preserve us in safety. The house of the Lord guarantees us of safety and peace. The church is an extension of Jesus here on earth. Jesus is the head of the church and the church is an extension of his body. Saul and Tarsus led a movement that persecuted the disciples of Jesus and was on his way to Damascus when a sudden light struck him from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Acts chapter 9 verse 4. Jesus fully identifies with the church. Whatever touches the church touches him. You are an extension of Jesus here on earth. What Jesus was and what he did in his earthly ministry is what the church has been called by God to be and to do. Jesus said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. John chapter 9 verse 5. In other words, as long as I am localized here on earth within my physical body, I am the light of the world. Furthermore, he said, ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on an hill cannot be hid. Matthew chapter 5 verse 13 to 14. The church is the carrier of the light that Jesus Christ is. Jesus Christ is not directly the light of the world anymore as it were. Jesus is the light in the church while the church is to lighten the world. As long as Jesus is the light of the church, you and I are sent forth out of the church to be light in the world. He does not call you the salt of the church, but the salt of the earth. He does not call you the light of the church, but the light of the world. The church, therefore, is the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Salt is used for preservation. We have been called by God to go into the marketplace and to the places of our endeavors to be agents of preservation and direction. We are designed and charged to keep the earth from decadence and to give it direction. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. 
John chapter 14, verse 12. God said you will not only do the works that Jesus did, but you have been enabled to do great, greater works. The church united and purified is going to do far more than one individual. Jesus did by the power of the Holy Ghost. The church is the carrier of the light that Jesus Christ is. Jesus is the light in the church, while the church is to lighten the world. Chapter 5. Let your light shine. It is one thing for you to be light, and it is quite another thing for you to shine. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew chapter 5, verse 15 to 16. Jesus' statement in the above text implies that it is possible to be a carrier of light and yet not shine that light. Light can be contained, covered, or hidden. This is the scenario with many Christians today. We are recipients and carriers of the light of God, but the world is not seeing much of the light coming from the church. We have become as corrupt, arrogant, covetous, and greedy as every other person on the street. What we find in the world system, I reiterate here, is simply a reflection of what is found in the church. We must confront ourselves and deal with this glitch. We must be willing to go against the ills in our society. Majority of people are conforming to and flowing along with the current of corruption. But we must stand up to say no. We must choose to be different that is how our light shines. For one to carry light within and not express it speaks of living a life of hypocrisy and falsehood. It is a case of saying one thing but doing something else. If your actions conflict with your words, then something is wrong. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Matthew chapter 6, verse 22 to 23. When the light in a child of God becomes darkness, it implies that the glory has departed. It speaks of Ichabod. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel, because the ark of God was taken, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 21. In other words, the glory has departed from the church when the presence of God that dispels the manifestation of darkness is absent. One of the most miserable ways of living on earth is to live a life supposedly called a Christian life, but greatly lacking the presence and the glory of God. When the glory of God is upon you, you enjoy a life of vibrancy, spiritual energy, and excitement. But when the glory departs, one life's survival mode. Walking with God becomes a platitude. Believers in this situation sometimes doubt if they were ever born again or are still born again. The life of a Christian is not supposed to be stagnant or boring. Rather, it ought to be exciting, adventurous, victorious, and joyous because he or she is connected to the one who is the source of life. But seldom do you find that spark in the eyes of many believers. They just go to church to fulfill a religious itch and engage in mundane traditions that have no relevance to the call of Christ. A vibrant life in God is one marked with the experience and evidence of spending quality time with the Word of God and in the place of prayer. It is one expressed by a heart that is tender in worship and where tears flow freely in adoration of God and all that He stands for. Obvious of who is around. Unfortunately, there are those who have become so hardened in their hearts that sensitivity to God's presence is not up for discussion. God has become routine and worship to them is business as usual. But those who are tender hearted and malleable before God are always looking for more of God. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wouldst not despise. Psalm 51 verse 7. 
Some have become so comfortable with sin that indulging in all that displeases God has become normal practice, such that they no longer feel any sense of conviction or condemnation when they do wrong. When one gets to this point, where sensitivity to the conviction by the Holy Spirit for wrongdoing is non-existent, then there is a question on the authenticity of the person's salvation. When you do wrong and live normally, I question how born again you are. The psalmist prayed, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Psalms 51 verse 10 to 12. This is a cry from the heart of one who was walking with God, but stepped out of line. His cry was repentant and desperate. No, God, let me not die like this. Let me not end up without your glory. Let me not end up without feeling your presence and your power again. You need to come back to Jesus. Religion will take you to hell and destruction. Do not let the enemy make you comfortable in sin. The enemy's plot is to throw you into a hot mess. You are smart enough to know what is true and what is false. What the devil does is to mix the truth with some lies in a manner that you can hardly know the difference. Chapter 6. The Glory of God Everything you are looking for and that you ever desire is found in the glory of God. The Ark of the Covenant is symbolic of the tangible glory of God among men. It is that presence that makes you who you are. I do not want to live a life without His glory and presence. It is better to be dead physically than to be alive without the glory of the Lord. Without the glory of the Lord, you are naked, exposed, and vulnerable to the attacks of the devil. Life is empty and void without the glory of God upon you. When we despise and devalue it and live normally, as though it is of no consequence, the glory departs. Your pursuit is a proof of your desire, how to bring back the glory. The good news is that the glory of God can be recovered and renewed. There are three things you can do to bring back the glory. Number one, repentance. Sin is what drives the glory of God away. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3 verse 23. Whenever you sin, something inside you dies. You need to resurrect that thing by confession and repentance, making a definite turnaround from the path of sin. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visited him? For thou had made him a little lower than the angels, and had crowned him with glory and honor. Psalm 8 verse 4 to 5. Number two, consecration. After repentance, you must consecrate your life, your body, and all to God. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 2. Number three, purity. Take a stand for purity and righteousness. Dare to stand out in the crowd. Choose to stand for and with God against popular opinions that kick against the godly principles of God's word. God wants you to carry his tangible presence and demonstrate his glory here on earth. Purity, power, and prosperity go together. Obadiah chapter 17. The anchor between power and prosperity is purity. The ark of God's presence can only be carried on the shoulders of sanctified priests. So the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. And the children of the Levites bear the ark of God upon their shoulders with the staves thereon, as Moses commanded according to to the word of the Lord. 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 14 to 15. Some people fear man more than they fear God. To stay off sin, let the fear of God rule your heart. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 6. Number four, fervent prayers. In the place of concerted prayer, we align ourselves to the will and mind of God. 
The ark of God was brought back through prayers. Number five, praise. Praise creates a habitation for God. If you want to carry his presence, be a man of praise. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Psalm chapter 22, verse 3. When you praise him, he comes to reside there. Thus all Israel brought up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord with shouting and with sounding of the cornet and with trumpets and with cymbals, making noise with psalmsteries and harps. First Chronicles chapter 15, verse 28. That is how to bring back the glory. Thank you for listening. Apostle Goodhart, as he's fondly known, serves as the apostolic lead of Horn of Revival Ministry Horn, a global outreach ministry with the mandate to carry the torch of revival across nations. He is also the lead pastor of Revival House of Glory International Church, Rogic, the church expression of Horn, a fast-growing prophetic church with headquarters in Abuja, Nigeria. He is a prolific writer with over 30 books, including the classic titles, Revival is Here Again, Catch the Fire, and Living in the Father's Love Zone. Apostle Goodhart is a mentor to many and a well-traveled, astute teacher of God's Word. Passionate about raising a new generation of leaders, he hosts two outreach programs, Bethel Ministers and Leaders Conferences, BEMIL, and Winning Today on Campus, which in over a decade has positively affected several thousands of ministers, leaders, professionals, and young people for the Lord. He is the host of the weekly insightful and inspirational radio program, Winning Today, and the television broadcast, Revival is here again with Pastor Goodhart. He hosts the wave-making online Global Prophetic Prayer Altar, GPPA, which airs on www.rogic.radio.org and other media platforms. He's happily married to Pastor Abimbola Ekweme, his life partner and best friend, and they are blessed with three lovely sons and a beautiful daughter. Thank you again for listening. You can contact us at www.rogic.org or on all our social media platforms at Apostle Goodhart. <laughs>